Good morning. Today is April 15th, and I hope you've paid your taxes, and that's been the high point of your day. So now I'm going to talk about the disasters of the world. I'm going to start with a few minutes talking about Gaza and then talk about the whole Iran uh, Israel situation and maybe end again with Gaza. So let me just remind ourselves before uh, Hamas attacked Israel and killed all of these Israelis, innocent Israelis, some of them, by the way, belonged on a kibbutz, which tried to uh, connect with Palestinians and develop better relations, which is very unfortunate. In any event, it's a sad mess. But um, it's useful to remind ourselves that the government of Netanyahu had a 145-page report detailing that Hamas was going to more or less do what it did in Israel. And furthermore, there were Israeli soldiers, women actually, along the barrier between Israel and, and Gaza and Hamas. And they reported activity that concerned them, and their report was ignored. So I think when the history of all of this is written, it needs to be said that the horrendous stuff that happened to Israel might have been prevented if Israel's government, Netanyahu government, had paid any attention. In any event, there is Hamas and the nightmare in Hamas. And as you know, um, by now it's almost 35,000 people have been killed, mostly women and children. The population is still starving. Uh, malnourishment is really very bad. Uh, let us remind ourselves when small children are malnourished, even if they get survive and get nourishment, very often this has an impact on both their physical and mental development. We know this from other countries that had serious um, famines of one kind or another. So the mess in Gaza continues, although we have in the last few days uh, taken our eyes off of it because of the uh, attack from uh, Iran on, on Israel. Um, now, what has gotten less uh, attention in the news is that Israel attacked a um, consulate in Damascus, an Iranian consulate in Damascus, and killed a general and several other Iranians. And that that presumably was what led Iran to uh, make the attack on, on Israel. So one of the things that historians might want to look at is why in the world, presumably in order to deflect from Gaza, did the Israelis decide this was a good time to kill an Iranian general? And did they really expect to, there not to be any response to that? Anyway, it was what it was. And then Iran, for the first time, attacked um, Israel in a massive fashion with drones and all kinds of aerial things, which, as you also know from the news, uh, did very little damage in Israel because the shield around Israel, as well as uh, Great Britain and the United States uh, helping to shoot all of these down before they could do some damage. But the attack was really very serious, right? And could have done a lot of harm if it had not been that the counter technology was available to thwart uh, serious damage being done to, to, uh, to Israel. So after the attack, uh, what the Iranians essentially said was, well, we made this attack in response to uh, Israeli um, activities in Damascus, um, violating international law by attacking a uh, diplomatic building uh, and killing this general. And now we're done. 
we've, uh, we're not going to do any more uh, at this particular point. So in theory, um, one could leave well enough alone. That is to say, is if Iran is you know satisfied that it has responded, even though the response was potentially very serious, um, Israel could just say, okay, they're going to stop and we're going to stop and refocus on Gaza and the various attacks that the surrogates of Iran, for example, in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, um, in Yemen, who are all sort of have been acting as surrogates of Iran, and we're going to focus back on them and not get into a potential nuclear conflict uh, with, with Iran. Now, many in the West, including the United States and England, the heads of state, have said that what Israel's uh, best um, position right now should be not to counter and escalate, that if it now countered, counters the Iranian attack, unsuccessful as it was on Israel, then in point of fact, you could have a major conflagration uh, throughout the Middle East. And that would be an utter, utter nightmare. Uh, Netanyahu, in, there are people in, and policymakers and politicians in Israel who are also saying, uh, let's just leave things as they are for the moment. Let's not escalate. And any response on Israel's part right now would lead to an escalation. But the Netanyahu government seems not to agree with that. And they're, they're saying that they are planning a response to the Iranian attack. A response to the Iranian attack, of course, sounds very satisfactory, especially to a right-wing government in Israel, because, you know, the Iranians potentially could have done huge harm. And this was the first Iranian attack, and there should be a counterattack on Iran of one kind or another to let the Iranians understand that they can't just be doing these sorts of things and that uh, Israel will respond. In this particular case, if Israel responds, most of its allies, including the United States, will not necessarily want any part of it because nobody particularly is anxious to have the whole Middle East go up in, in flames. So we are at a stalemate at the moment. Uh, the Israeli cabinet is meeting and trying to decide how they're going to be respond and whether or not um, Israel will listen to saner voices, the United States, European countries, uh, Sunni countries in the Middle East by saying, let's not escalate this. This is, this is going to be very dangerous. Uh, uh, it's hard to know whether Israel the government, Netanyahu government, uh, will, uh, you know, listen one way or the other. In the meantime, of course, we've had several days now where we've heard very little about Gaza, right? And the killing in Gaza continues. Um, Israel says they're still going to attack Rafah. They have now, due to the pre international pressure, agreed to let more food in, and they are go we're going to open several more um, uh, routes into, into Gaza to bring food in. Uh, some of the routes that they said that they were going to open, they haven't actually opened yet, but they have opened some. And certainly, as we speak, more food is getting into Gaza. So now in the idea in Gaza is, or the Israeli idea is that the million and some almost million and a half people in Gaza who were chased down to Rafah in order to avoid getting killed in Northern Gaza, uh, that they can just be told to go somewhere else. And then, um, you know, uh, Israel can get after the residual leadership that it believes is now in, in Rafa. Uh, most observers believe, and I include myself, 
that uh, the idea of telling all those uh, refugees from the rest of Gaza who are now in Rafah that they simply should go back where they came from uh, is to some extent delusional because where they came from, 60 to 70 percent of all the housing has been bombed to shredderines. So exactly where are those people going to live, which of course is a long-term, medium-term and long-term problem in Gaza. Gaza is essentially been decimated, right, in terms of um, uh, roads, buildings, schools, hospitals. Very little is still functioning in Gaza. Uh, the point, of course, from the perspective of Israel is that it will uh, decimate the leadership in, um, in Gaza and conquer Hamas, and that will take care of Hamas as a uh, you know potential danger to Israel in the future. Now, unfortunately, what has happened is that uh, first of all, a lot of the population of Gaza were not enthusiasts or supporters of Hamas to begin with, although they now have a fair amount of sympathy with Hamas. And furthermore, uh, the Israelis are imagining that on the West Bank, where the Palestinians were not, by and large, fans of Hamas at all, uh, the Palestinian Authority is dysfunctional. And for the last few months, there has been lively discussion about, you know, how you can uh, produce a Palestinian government in Gaza and so forth. Um, but that's all fairly delusional. And one of the things that the Western countries, including the United States, and many folks who are very concerned, rightly so, about the future of Israel, uh, are talking about is that any kind of cessation of conflict in Gaza at the end of the day has to produce a two-state solution, uh, finally, right? After decades of a two-state solution not having come into being. So here there are a few wrinkles. One of the explanations for the support of Israel, of Hamas, indirectly before the current conflict, has been that the Netanyahu government essentially liked the idea of having Hamas in Gaza because it gave an excuse for why a two-state solution wasn't feasible. And one of the um, hallmarks of the Netanyahu government and right-wing Israelis is we don't want a state two-state solution. So if you can create a situation where a two-state solution is not viable, uh, then, uh, you know, that's one less thing to worry about. Um, the fact that this conflict now in Gaza and now the conflict with as that has been ignited amongst the Shiite countries in the Middle East and Iran, uh, the fact that a two-state solution is pro probably an impossible solution um, has not really sunk in. I mean, there are observers both inside and outside of Israel who are saying that, you know, this two-state solution, which used to be offered as the solution to the Palestinian-Israeli problem, is no longer a viable uh, solution uh, for all the reasons of what has happened recently. And in addition to the uh, much of the population, not only of Gaza, but also of the West Bank, Palestinian population, is now somewhat feeling somewhat warm uh, towards uh, Hamas because it sees the Palestinians in Hamas being so beleaguered, being killed, having their homes destroyed. And so even though they were never in favor of Hamas, uh, they are now sort of polls and so forth have suggested uh, people were, are slightly feeling slightly warmer about Hamas, which in turn has led to different theorizing about the future of that part of the world, which is that a um, a two state solution is if it's ever to come about has to include Hamas, maybe not the head figures. Uh, that are responsible to the uh, assault on Israel, 
Uh, but Hamas as an institution probably will continue and can't be killed off anymore. So that any future uh, solution to the Palestinian situation probably has to um, include Hamas, uh, presumptively not a Hamas which is a killing machine, but a Hamas which is going to play a role amongst other Palestinian organizations and groups to figure out what to do in the future. Now, the idea of a two-state solution is still um, enthusiastically supported by the United States and by other countries. But there are increasing voices that say, well, a two-state solution is no longer viable, even if it does include Hamas in some fashion. Um, and one has to think about the whole area as perhaps being a unitary state uh, which has areas and representatives that represent uh, Palestinians. There are all kinds of ideas floating around right now, which are very preliminary and which I don't want to bore you with. But the idea is if a two-state solution is in fact not a fix, then the question is what exactly is a fix? And here, any number of well-informed observers look at Israel itself and are saying, look, Israel was ready to be integrated and have good relations with the Sunni countries in the region. For example, Saudi Arabia, for example, Egypt, for example, other countries which are Jordan, for example, uh, and that um, Israel could, you know, be acknowledged and have good relations with these countries and it could create peace in at least a portion of, of the Middle East. Now that now at the moment looks like a pipe dream given what the Iranians have just done, but it isn't entirely off the table. And if it isn't off the table and the Sunni countries uh, can make an inroads in making alliances and funding and so forth of the, non of the Sunni part of the Middle East, uh, you might in fact get, if not a short term, at least the long term solution where Palestinians politically have some rights, even if it's not their state, and where um, there might be more of an integration between the Palestinians and the state of Israel. Now, of course, that sounds very far fetched at the moment. And it's particularly far fetched when you look at Israel up until recently, anyway, uh, which is 20% of the Israeli population are what the Israelis call Pal uh, Israeli Arabs, they're Palestinians. And one of, of course, the attacks against Israel has been that it has created a kind of apartheid state inside of Israel by mistreating their Arab populations, not giving them full political or any kinds of rights. And that, that this does not bode well for the Israelis living together uh, with Palestinians, even if they're Palestinians that accept uh, uh, Jewish dominance, uh, you know, the Israeli state that is dominated by, by uh, Jews, etc. So what I'm sketching in a way is um, old boogaboos about how to resolve the mess in the Middle East um, it are coming to the fore. People are rethinking the last 70 years or so what could be done or should be done, what Israel might have done, what other states might have done, and how you can lower the temperature in that part of the world. Now, you, it's hard to lower the temperature in terms of, of Iran because Iran is the big counterpower uh, to Saudi Arabia, right? And Iran's interests and Saudi Arabia's interests are quite different, and they have quite different alliances. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can have quite different societies, religions, and so forth, and figure out some way for people to live together in the long term. 
That is very far-fetched as I speak this Monday morning, because if the Israelis attack the Iranians directly rather than their surrogates, uh, in places like Yemen and um, Lebanon, for that matter, um, then all hell will break loose. And it is very unclear that once hell breaks loose, exactly how you're going to, um, how you're going to proceed. So even though the Israeli cabinet is meeting right now and trying to figure out how it's going to respond, and people who you know, want to be of assistance to Israel, heads of state, uh, citizens, and so forth, say, well, you know, Israel has to respond in some ways. Uh, sometimes, you know, power and influence come from not acting rather than acting. The message got, has been transferred to Iran that not only does Israel have a way to defend itself, but also United States and your, some European countries will back it up. And Iran is not in very good shape itself right now. Uh, the current Ayatollah will probably die. They will have to have a new uh, one. Uh, there are bad economic situations for the Iranians. Uh, there are all the uh, you know demonstrations in Iran and so on. So Iran is hardly at this moment in a very good position itself and very stable. And it would be crazy if it would uh, exacerbate the conflict in the Middle East precisely in terms of it, Iran, directly doing something. Now, the fact that the surrogates like... Um, Hezbollah in uh, in uh, Lebanon, uh, and the Israelis may continue to shoot it out to some extent, uh, and the Hutus in Yemen may still stop, you know, boats. And uh, I think that, uh, or this is just a guess, that that's not about to stop. But it's manageable as long as the big actors don't get into the into the middle of it. Um, then uh, if you imagine for a moment that Israel will not escalate the conflict in the Middle East in the next few days or few weeks and won't you know, take it upon themselves of killing some Iranian uh, military officers, whether they're in Iraq or whether they're in, in Syria, then the question is um, the focus comes back uh, in a very serious way onto Gaza and what to do about Gaza. And, you know, uh, we've discussed, and you're well aware of the fact, that since Gaza is now a basket case, I mean, people have no schools, no hospitals, uh, have uh, the Israelis have lost support in the, by the killing of aid workers, right, the, the central kitchen people, uh, which, you know, there were any number of people and they've gotten a lot of attention. But the fact is that um, the uh, 200 or so aid workers have been killed. Doctors, volunteer doctors have been killed. None of this uh, has a favorable uh, uh, consequence in countries which have been trying to help the people, the people in Gaza. But let's assume for a minute that uh, the Israelis managed to kill off the top leadership uh, of Hamas. Uh, by the way, it managed to kill two sons of one of the leaders of Hamas the other day. That is also not a very promising way to make peace. Uh, let's just assume it managed to kill off uh, the main leadership and declare victory. Then what in terms of Gaza? And then what? It means the rest of the world, uh, whether it's non-governmental organizations, which you and I are funding, or whether it's transfer of resources from industrial countries, uh, it, and or whether the burden, main burden is going to be carried by Saudi Arabia. But millions and billions have to go into Gaza to make it a habitable place again. Well, if you read the Israeli press, that's actually considered by the, by some in Israel as unlikely 
That is to say, the cost of rebuilding Gaza uh, is going to be so huge that it would actually be much more, much cheaper and much more viable if the remaining Gazans were spread out to other countries. Uh, so the idea is, you know, Egypt could take some of the Palestinians and some more could move into other, um, you know, uh, Sunni friendly countries. Uh, maybe Jordan could absorb some more and so on. Uh, this, I would say, is largely a pipe dream. Nobody wants these Palestinians. Uh, and these Palestinians don't particularly want to go live in these other countries either. So the idea that, okay, you've now sort of destroyed Gaza, and if you're not going to have a, a regional Middle East war with Iran, then things will quiet down as soon as the Israelis have done finished their uh, killing off of the top leadership, and then the rest of the world uh, will think, well, now we have to jump in and try to rebuild Gaza. Uh, or alternatively, the Israelis have floated the idea it would be much better and the, the Palestinians in Gaza would have a much better life if they just spread around the world a little bit and moved to other countries and other countries would, would absorb them. Now, there may be some Palestinians which are willing to go somewhere, but by and large, the Palestinians uh, don't have that particular interest. Now you could say, well, some of them might be able to move to the West Bank and maybe you could create some coherency uh, both economic and political in the West Bank. Well, that requires the West Bank to have a governing structure, but it also requires something else. And that is that in the West Bank, Israel has pushed more and more settlers and supported more and more settlers in the West Bank, including, uh, you know, radical Orthodox individuals uh, who have just simply taken the land from the Palestinians and more and more of the uh, natural as well as other resources in the West Bank are now under the control of um, of Israelis uh, and right very right wing Israelis by and large very religious and very right wing Israelis and encouraging that on the part of Israel has also created a situation that makes the West Bank less viable as a future uh, seat for Palestinians because the Palestinians will will say well you know if we can have the West Bank back and create a state in the West Bank, maybe we could have a conversation, but that is not the intention of the Netanyahu government. So in sum, if things go badly, we're going to have a major and nasty war in the Middle East, which will be very destructive and which will involve the United States and other countries. If saner voices uh, come to the fore in Israel, uh, and say a tit for tat will just increase an even worse situation in this part of the world. And if the Iranians are able to now say to their own population, see, we've acted against these awful people uh, who are killing uh, Palestinians. Uh, and if the countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, like the Gulf countries, who are in a position to help finance uh, the displaced Palestinians and help rebuild to some extent, are willing to say, okay, uh, we are opposed to uh, the uh, Iranian influence in our region, but let's cool it for the moment and let's try to have sort of some sane negotiations of how we can all live in some viable viable fashion. Um, in the meantime, the radicals in Iran, of course, are saying, given what's going on with uh, in Gaza and, and the Israelis, you know, killing off one of our generals, we better speed up uh, the development of a nuclear weapon. And that is a whole different subject because if uh, Iran comes seriously nuclear, 
Uh, it also means that Saudi Arabia and some other countries will want to go seriously nuclear. And the more nuclear powers there are, the more danger there is of accidents and or even the use of limited nuclear weapons. So the picture I am sketching is that on this Monday the 15th, everything is very confused. Everything is dependent on Israel cooling it at the moment and taking the word of Iran that it has done what it ha wanted to do to show that, you know, we're here and we can attack Israel. Uh, and in the meantime, everybody else is treading water, very fearful that in a, uh, an, an ex not only an explosion, but an acceleration of conflict between the various uh, uh, groupings, the very whether it's uh, you know in Yemen, the Houthis in Yemen, whether it's the you know other groupings, Hezbollah in north of, of uh, in part of, of Israel in Lebanon, uh, whether all of these groups will also be willing to cool it. Um, and to see what can be rescued in this incredibly messy and I would emphasize extremely serious situation. Now, by the time you listen to it, uh, the wheels may have turned and certain things may have gotten worse or gotten sorted out. But as I speak today, the Middle East is pretty much in flames, literally and figuratively. And uh, one just hopes that... Um, you know, Iran can batten down the hatchet in those countries and groups that it has some influence on, and the United States and other countries can have some influence on Israel, not to make matters worse. And then everybody needs to search for a solution, short-term, medium, and long-term, about what to do about the Palestinians, um, both in Israel and in the West Bank and in Gaza. Thank you very much for listening. Talk to you again in two weeks.